Uh, but now we're joined by Tony Caridi. How are you doing today, Tony? I'm doing well. Nice to be with you guys. And uh, kick off just over two weeks away, Penn State for the first game. Uh, that's going to be a big game for game one. Yeah, there's no question. Uh, obviously, two teams that haven't seen each other in a long time and uh, much story tradition uh, between these two schools, obviously, uh, with the way things shook out uh, in one of the early stages of conference realignment that put an end to the annual series between these two teams. Uh, Penn State comes in highly touted, number seven in the country, returns you know, a tremendous number of those players that had a good solid season uh, a year ago, and obviously for West Virginia. Um, some retooling, a uh, different quarterback as well. So a lot of interesting side angles to all of this. You mentioned uh, quarterback. What's the quarterback situation looking like for WV this year? Well, at this point, uh, no official starter has been named. Obviously, it's Garrett Green and Nico Markiel. Uh They'll get ready to battle it out again uh, tomorrow night. There'll be a closed scrimmage and probably be the last major scrimmage um, before they settle in on their two deep and really start to hone in on their preparation for Penn State. Uh, you know, to this point, there's been a lot of, you know, coach speak. Uh, about that particular position. I don't think that Neil Brown wanted to, you know, tamper with it. In other words, name one too early. He wanted to have a complete competition through the course of these preseason practices. Obviously, we're getting really close uh, for him to make that call. It should be coming, I would think, you know, in the not-too-distant future. Um, but at this point, you know, in watching practices, uh, they both at times have made plays. And, um, you know, I don't know which way uh, w the staff-wise, you know, you're, you're basically just trying to identify which guy gives you the best chance to win, and that'll ultimately be that decision. Tony Collin here. Thanks for joining us. Uh, what are the strengths and weaknesses of this team from your point of view so far? Well, the biggest strength would certainly be the offensive line. Um, this is a group that really started from scratch when Neil first took over, and now you're into year number five, and you've got guys that have you know, really truly developed uh, within this system. Uh, when you take a look at the combined number of starts, which is just over 130 combined starts among the five starters on that offensive line, that's significant. And, uh, you know, I think that, this is where this, you know, the success of this offense will hinge upon, in large part, you know, to how well that group plays, but perhaps even more so with how consistent they are. I think that they cannot afford to have an off day. Uh, I think their worst has to be a good game, and I think their peak days have to be that they were extremely good. And I think that is important because the strength of this team is going to be its ability to run the football. I mean, if you're going to have a quarterback, whether it's Garrett Green or whether it's Nico Markiel, that will have the ability to make plays with their feet. So that's another asset to the running game uh, that West Virginia has not had in Neal's previous four teams. And then you take the fact that you have three legitimate running backs um, in that room with C.J. Donaldson, with Justin Johnson, and with Jalen Anderson. And so that is, without question, the strength. In regard to you know a weakness or perhaps just question marks, Mark. You know, it's that receiving core. Who among those guys uh, will be able to be productive on a regular basis? Uh, last year, we had some familiar names, the Bryce Ford Wheaton, Sam James, at all. Uh, we also had transfer with Prather leaving. Um, so you had a lot of guys that played a lot of football that are no longer here. So they went out of the portal. They picked up Devin Carter, among others. And so how quickly can those guys uh, put themselves into a position to be consistent? That remains to be seen. So if you want to say weakness or you want to say question mark, which other, whatever word you want to use, it would be there. Over on the defensive side, you know, I don't think that they have on the defensive line, I don't think that they have, you know, that that guy that we've had in the past that, that has the potential to be, you know, a dominant player. Uh, they have they have gone from the Stills brothers, and we've obviously Akeem Mesidor transferred a couple seasons ago. But they feel, I think, they like who they like where they are. And Neil said that as many as, you know, they could rotate eight or nine guys on that defensive front. So does that mean you have... 
no stars, or does that mean you have a bunch of guys that you can depend on to get it done? You know, that remains to be seen. And then, you know, some familiar names at the linebacker spots, guys that have been around. Lee Kobo will be in his second season. They've been praising him for his leadership. Weakness-wise, I think you could probably point toward that weak side linebacker where you just don't have guys that have played a lot of football at that spot. So that's going to be, to this point, you know, it's most likely going to be by committee. We'll see how that settles. And then your defensive backfield, you know, they, they hit the portal pretty good to fill holes. And one of the names that we're continuing to hear this preseason is Beanie Bishop, a young guy who transferred in uh, from the University of Minnesota. He's played a lot of football. And I think that he is a guy that will come in there and immediately make an, an impact as a starting corner. And in all likelihood, you'll see him on some of the return groups. So, you know, to me, it's a chemistry issue on the back half of that defense. They were not good as a defense a year ago. No one uh, would ever try to contend that they were including that entire coaching staff. They know where they are. Um, so how much better can they be is the question. Hey, Tony, Dylan Bishop here. Uh, this is year five for Neil Brown now. He's going back to calling the plays. And I don't think any, I think it's fair to say that this hasn't really gone the way that WVU fans have expected under Neil Brown. Do you think this year, year five, is the make or break kind of year, considering there's already been a lot of conjecture from fans about you know, a, a coaching change, paying his buyout, you know, at taking to in, in, in take into account that there's a $45 million budget shortfall for the university in general. Do you think this is the, the make or break year for Neil Brown as the head coach? Well, I think if you directed that question, Neil, he would say yes. So I will follow suit. Yeah, it is. Um, you know, five years, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of um, the schedule that he inherited with this non-conference mess that they've been into with these two Power Five schools, or regardless of COVID, um, it is. And uh, I think that Ren Baker, you know, he's come out and, you know, one of the biggest things that uh, has, he was tasked with when taking the job was evaluating the football program. And, you know, he told us on our podcast earlier this summer, you know, he's not going to say, hey, it's a win total. Hey, it's got to be this number or that number. He said, I don't do it that way. I do it by, you know, taking a look at the totality of the program, what its direction is. Because, you know, we've watched football teams. We've watched we watched six, six win football teams that were good. And we've seen eight win football teams that weren't that good. I mean, it's to the, it, there's always a reality of it. What's it really look like? And I think that's going to be his approach. Uh, is this is this program headed long term in the right direction to be successful and to have the success that it has had in the past and that Mountaineer fans um, have come to um, enjoy and have come to require uh, for their fandom? And so that's what ultimately will be the evaluation point. But there's no question that um, this will be that that moment of his tenure that that decision will. Will be made as to whether uh, to change or to whether to keep this thing going forward. What do you make of it's been out for I believe over a month now of West Virginia being picked last in the conference this year? It doesn't matter to be quite honest with you. It means nothing. Um, it's the poll. Um, most of the time, if you take go if you take a look back when the season's over, compared to what it was supposed to be when the season started, very very rarely um, do the do those teams fall into those places. So I don't put a lot of stock into it. I mean, I I can see. You know, for someone that doesn't follow the team on a regular basis, um, why they would say that. They look at it and they go, okay, uh, you're playing two power fives and you're opening on the road at a power five and you have to change your quarterback and you lost a bunch of receivers and you lost this guy and that guy on the defensive end. I mean, I could see how they could do the math on that and just say, okay, who am I going to put here? But and the fact he didn't go to a bowl game. So I can see it, but like it, do it doesn't mean anything at all. Tony, we're running short on time, so last question here. Conference realignment, four new teams in the Big 12, and then Texas, Oklahoma leaving after this season, and then a few more teams coming back. So just talk about the craziness and what you're excited for getting to see some new places in the conference. 
Well, it's uh, you know these are these are these are interesting. However, what word you want to use? They're interesting. They're weird. They're different. Um, you know, we're heading into a new world of college athletics, and unfortunately, we're we're leaving a world of why so many folks followed college athletics, and that was the regionality, and that's why we would you know for years get excited about you know the teams that we would play on an annual basis because geographically, um, you know. They were they were close by, and there was this you know this uh, this regionality that made college sports great. And I'm talking about West Virginia, Maryland, West Virginia, Pitt, West Virginia, Penn State, West Virginia, Virginia Tech, and that's all gone. And it won't come back uh, for you know forever or for the foreseeable future. And so I'm, 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 it bums me out some, but at the same time, I've been living in this world of 11 years now that we've played, and this will be our 12th season in the Big 12, and I've grown accustomed to it. And so this most recent group of newcomers, the four that are coming this year, the four that will come next year, just kind of uh, reaffirms that we're in an entirely new world of collegiate athletics. It's a professional model uh, that we've entered into, and you have to be one of those folks on that group, in that group of schools. Otherwise, you've got no chance of viability whatsoever. And so as a result, you know, you just kind of do it. You get through it, and you try to find the good that comes out of it. But, you know, I think we'll always uh, miss uh, the annual battles with uh, with the teams that you have 30s and 40s and 50s and 60 year pluses of, of tradition and games through. Uh, that's why this Penn State game will be so fun is that you have so much history uh, between the two schools. But it's it, as they say, and it's kind of a trite expression. It is what it is, and that's the world that you have to be in in order to play this game. And so we we go forward and see how it all goes. All right, Tony, thanks for the time, and uh, we'll be looking forward to hearing you on the station coming up here as two weeks away from that Penn State game. All right, guys, appreciate it. Thank you very much. Have a good weekend. You as well. Tony Caridi, West Virginia University Mountaineers, play-by-play.